Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, uh, along with uh, Janet Jansen, who is stumbling over my bag in the front row, uh, and, uh, and Rob Knight, we, we uh, formed something in 2010 called the Earth Microbiome Project, which was an opportunity to basically leverage, at the time, uh, the, uh, the Amplicon sequencing approaches to just generate a massive quantity of data. We currently have over 190,000 um, 16 s data sets about... Uh, about 20,000 metagenomic data sets, and there's a lot more than that that aren't available. Um, and then some metabolomic data sets in, in uh, about 30, 40,000 of those um, uh, that are publicly available, and you can go and download the data with varying levels of, of accessibility for the metadata that goes along with them, telling you about where they come from. Um, but you know, we were always very excited. It just gave us carte blanche to work in any kind of environment. But um, I got stuck in a snowstorm and I was living in Chicago um, uh, for 10 years with a program officer for the Sloan Foundation in 2011. And, uh, and uh, she said, well, you know, we got literally stuck and couldn't drive anywhere, so we just sat there for about uh, two and a half hours. And she said, well, why don't you uh, apply to this program we're starting up, this built environment program? And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I really don't think so. It's not really proper science. And then uh, somehow, like 10 years later, I'm doing this on a regular basis and have no idea what happened. Um, it, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paula, it's all your fault. Um, uh, and now I just moved. I, I left uh, Merrim behind at University of Chicago um, and, I, and Department of Surgery, and I've just moved to UC San Diego. Where I'm now in pediatrics and oceanography, so I'm the world's first pediatric oceanographer <laughs> or oceanographic pediatrician, um, which again gives me carte blanche. Part of the moving package was they gave me an office on the beach so I can surf literally every day with the lab now, which is kick ass. I couldn't surf in Chicago, the, uh, the surf was solid, as in frozen. Um, uh, so, Hopefully my computer can handle the, uh, the clicks. Um, I'll just do this. Um, so disclosures, I have uh, a number. I, I believe in uh, translating science into the um, uh, public domain as quickly as possible. And therefore, I promote uh, the rapid development of startup companies and the, uh, the uh, translation of IP into organizations which are effective, right? Because there are a lot of people out there that are making uh, money out of these data sets uh, which produce uh, completely meaningless um, uh, programs. And I won't you know, name some. Some of them have failed already, like Ubiome is, was a terrible example. Um, and there are other examples like Viome where the, where the data uh, could be extremely valuable, but I have seen no, no data to support claims, right? And if I don't see data to support claims, then what the hell are you talking about? Right? It's my, my general opinion. So um, I, I, I always like this quote from Julian Davies, what's the diversity of the microbial world is catalogued that make astronomy look like a pitiful science. Um, we put this slide together in about 2010, and I did include pictures of the built environment then uh, without realizing that one day we'd be exploring it quite um, more sophisticatedly. Um, and it's true, there's a lot of microbial diversity everywhere. And we like to think of the built environment as being um, a, a microbiology on the edge of survival um, and a highly selective ecosystem that is shaping the evolution of species which um, have never seen this kind of environment before. So it's, from us, it's a fundamentally interesting exploration of life um, and we do a lot of work with NASA on, on now uh, thanks to a new grant on that um, line uh, linking our understanding of how things survive here to how things might survive in other environments um, so the microbiome of the built environment is predominantly human the bacterial populations coming off of your body out of every exhalation of breath of your skin um, uh, you're releasing about 38 million bacterial particles per um, uh, per hour or, or so into the immediate environment, so shedding that microbial burden. Uh, that's work from Jordan Peckier's group out at Yale. But the bacterial organisms which leave our body and can survive are, um, are fundamentally interesting to us because some of them are disease causing, others just stimulate our immune system. And when we think about the immune system, we often think about it in relationship to the intestine. Um, uh, we like to think of it as a national park service, a, a, a park warden going around trying to manage that environment, make sure that the bacterial populations that we need survive and thrive, and the ones that we don't want around are um, evacuated. Um, and we think about that in terms of the uh, gut, but it's also extremely true on the skin um, and in the upper respiratory tract, the, the other environments which interact with the environment. right? Um, and that, that relationship 
relationship is um, underplayed, uh, even though in immunology it's been studied for you know a hundred years or so. So understanding the microbial interactions and their immune system stimulating capabilities in these environments, these other mucosal surfaces, uh, we think is extremely valid. And uh, picking up on that, um, uh, from our environmental construction uh, that we've built around us, we have a number of different ways in which uh, microbes, viruses, protozoa, fungi, etc., interact with us. So firstly, fire inhalation and then exhalation, um, allowing a, a two-directional uh, mechanism of flow, as well as uh, through fomite-associated interaction. So everything's a fomite. Uh, this cup of tea is a fomite. Uh, this is a fomite. My face is a fomite. Um, that interaction with our environment is, again, bidirectional. Um, when you touch something, you leave behind your microbial signature, but you also pick up things, right? And the stability of those ecological relationships is something we're fundamentally interested in. But it goes one step further. Obviously, there's metabolites in this environment as well. Um, so dampness, um, uh, even from biblical times um, and, and before, has been um, identified as being negatively associated with health. If you have too much uh, moisture in an environment, you get fungal growth and mold growth. It can be related to respiratory disease. Um, and it can also be related to metabol metabolic um, uh, uh, onset of disease. So uh, the metabolites these organisms are producing, um, aldehydes, alcohols, amines, uh, geosamine, which can have an, an impact upon immune health and also lead to um, hypersensitivity responses in various populations. Um, there is a, uh, a I, I can't remember if I mentioned this one to you before, but like the, the, there's a, uh, a story which is probably BS, right? But it's fun in that um, uh, some fungi growing in old homes can produce uh, chemicals which stimulate um, neuro uh, behavioral abnormalities, right? You, you sense things, you hear things, audio stimulatory um, hallucinations. Um, so the old idea is you know, you go into an old house where the door's been locked, the concentration of these metabolites is high enough, you walk in, you breathe them in, you experience ghosts. Right? Uh, probably, again, BS, but a lovely story, and um, you know, who knows? Um, microbes can change our minds, as Elaine says, right? So maybe, uh, maybe they can do it for, via other routes as well. Um, and uh, we can see genomic evolution in these environments. Um, so work we've done uh, picking up genome isolates um, and then uh, resequencing them through metagenomic time series um, identifies uh, uh, specific uh, trajectories for um, uh, uh, synonymous versus non-synonymous mutation ratio differentials in uh, gene fragments in the genomes which are potentially of interest. Um, and we're now using Anvio uh, effectively uh, to rebuild these, uh, thanks to Meron's uh, um, developments. Uh, to be uh, allow us to actually pinpoint over time which regions of these genomes are changing. This is over the course of 170 odd days and shows a significant increase in the selection for regions of the genome that are associated with antibiotic resistance. Uh, but there are many others, right? These are these are organisms on again on the edge of survival and under very very uh, discrete and selective uh, environmental constructs. So the microbial world around us is ever present. Um, again, we are shedding those 38 million bacterial particles and approximately 7 million genome units of fungi into the environment around us. And we are literally in a constant interactome. Um, I love the people that go into a bathroom and, and uh, draw down their sleeve to open the door handle or, or you know, try to put too much toilet paper on the toilet seat. Um, it's very thin and there's lots of pores in that stuff and microbes are very small and can quite readily pass between it. Right? So the, the idea that doing this is going to stop you from picking up anything is, is kind of silly. Right? Uh, it's germophobic um, and therefore should be stopped. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But okay, we want to stop coronaviruses now, right? So that's also important. But this microbial world that we are interacting with on a regular basis is being enhanced by the fact that there's no other biological diversity in this room, right? We're hearing about the loss of biodiversity. We're bringing that on ourselves. So you see any plants or animals in here? The air's being filtered. Um, the, none of the windows or doors are open. Understanding that relationship and what it means for our um, overall immunological health is going to be vital moving forward. But as a microbiologist, albeit um, um, one with an ecological bent, not necessarily physiological, um, I, am, I am always interested in trying to track what's actually happening on a surface. So in this construct, we took uh, surface materials from common um, building materials like this stuff, uh, drywalling, um, uh, wood, um, uh, medium density fiberboard, and we colonized it by placing it in different uh, um, home contextual environments, um, a, a, a young family's home, 
um, a single man living with a dog. Um, these kind of systems, right? Um, we colonized them in those environments, and then brought them into the lab and put them under a high humidity environment. And then some of them we moistened, i.e. we um, allowed water to interface with the microbial community that had colonized those surfaces, and others we didn't. And the, the reason for that is, just like uh, taking bugs and putting them on an agar plate, we wanted to grow the organisms. We wanted them to germinate and, and grow and activate. Um, and uh, obviously, this is days of exposure to moisture and percent of surface area covered. All of these communities growing on um, little tiles of these materials are exposed to water, and you get a lot more growth. Interestingly, even in the absence of water, you select for organisms which are very good at abstracting, abstracting? No extracting moisture from the air, from the environment, and allowing slow, albeit slow, but um, functional metabolic interactive growth. And you also get a, a relationship um, between an increase in bacterial populations and viral populations. You see more phage um, expressed in that environment as we see more active bacterial populations. And um, under wetter conditions versus um, uh, uh, um, uh, wetter conditions versus normal conditions, uh, wet versus dry, non-wetted being here, blue, um, we see an increase in bacteria, an increase in viruses. Um, and then we see differential responses to bacteria and viruses across different types of material, like gypsum, medium density fireboard, gypsum that's been impregnated with something to stop it from growing fungi, and then um, uh, uh, this stuff. Um, and uh, bacteria and fungal diversity is very well correlated. And the more bacterial diversity you have, the generally the more fungal diversity you have. Um, uh, again, indicating that uh, if you have a different fun to fungi growing, you're going to have different types of bacteria growing. But you do get very differential relationships. So, for example, Bacillus and Pseudomonas growth is anti-correlated. If you have more Bacillus, you have less Pseudomonas. And I'll explain that a bit in a minute. And Eurotium grows very well in water, whereas Penicillium grows very well without water. Penicillium being very good at grabbing the moisture out of the air, Eurotium being not so good at that, but very good if there's lots of moisture around. Selective environments. This is pretty simple stuff. Um, and then if we actually dig down into the met metabolism of the, uh, of the chemicals that are changing on the surface of these materials as these communities grow, we see things like the um, antibacterial alkaloid nigronilin and fumigoclavin being correlated with ascomycota growth and negatively correlated with the abundance of Bacillus and Pseudomonas. So now you have fungi producing antibacterial compounds to clear the way or reduce competition in this highly selective, highly competitive environment. Um, things like uh, nigronilin being gracious on the MDF uh, um, where you see virtually no production of bacteria, um, NDF being here, um, and no bacterial population but a very large amount of nigronilin. I should just use the uh, pointer. Uh, like that. Uh, and virtually no bacteria but some penicillium growing very well. Um, and we can, we can derive correlative um, relationships between all the different variables, between all the different um, metabolites, um, using a uh, program that, we, um, that was developed by uh, Rob Knight and Peter Dorstein called um, MMVEC, um, and identifying particular co-correlation co relationships that identify associations between microbial growth and individual metabolites. And we can see that things like azoxystrobin is positively associated with the um, increase in the abundance of bacillus, negatively associated with pseudomonas, where a scopolectin shows the opposite relationship, suggesting, again, um, uh, uh, Bacillus, you have uh, genes for the production of azoxystrobin, and vice versa for Pseudomonas and Scopolectin. These are organisms, um, again, on the edge of survival, fighting it out and trying to identify those co-correlation relationships. Um, so exploring uh, that phenomenon coming back out of the ground, on the, of the surfaces and into the environment, uh, we wanted to explore what this phenomenon meant for interactions between humans and spaces. So we started out with the uh, hospital, which in 2013 became um, uh, available for us to explore. This is the um, uh, Center for Care and Discovery at University of Chicago, again, where I was for nine years. Um, it's a massive building. The lobby is up here in the, on the seventh floor, um, providing these beautiful views. These are all patient rooms on the top floor. Everybody gets a view. Um, it's like uh, Oprah with cars, but you know, so that's hospital rooms. 
Um, and then we have research uh, domains down here. Um, and it provided a real opportunity, right? Totally isolated building. There was no connectivity at the time to the outside. Um, and it had just been built, just gone, gone massive routine sterilization where we make sure there's virtually no bacterial biomass anywhere um, uh, using uh, ATP uh, monitoring of the surfaces and looking at qPCR measurements. And we went in and we swabbed surfaces and we applied metagenomics and amplicon sequencing uh, bacterial 16S and fungal ITS to identify the relationships. Um, and we did this for 365 consecutive days. I burnt through three postdocs doing this. Um, the first one quit after two months because it was just too intense. The last one quit after six months and then we, uh, we got um, another one on board. When I say quit, they quit that project and moved on to other projects. So I wasn't like, you know, literally burning them out. Uh, but we started two months pre-opening and then continued for 10 uh, further months uh, once the building became operational. Looking um, after operational activity at patient skin, hospital staff surfaces, um, but all the time at the room, air and water, the nurse station, providing us with an ability just to track and monitor, as a good epidemiologist does, um, the data points in our scenario over time. Um, and in this context, uh, you can see here, uh, this is post-opening in red, um, pre-opening in blue. Thanks for the description of an NMDS or PCOA plot. So you, you now know what that means. Um, and uh, we can see a very significant shift between pre-opening and post-opening. And this is caused by big changes in the types of organisms that are there. Post-opening, you see things like Karenibacteria, Staphylococcus, becoming significantly more abundant skin-associated bacteria. Uh, when we produced this finding, it was like, uh, yeah, you know, because there's lots of people moved in, uh, which is pretty obvious. Um, but it, it, uh, it's a nice uh, uh, d distinction that these environments uh, do actually differentiate under occupation. When people occupy these spaces, they're no longer just empty caves, um, they're now um, operationally bioactive um, interaction zones. Um, I should coin that term because that sounds cool. I just made that up. Um, <laughs> and you can see things like relative humidity in the environment, like we saw with relative humidity on the surface shaping microbial activity. We also see it shapes the interaction that people have microbiologically with their environment and with other people. So people actually share more bacterial similarity. Their microbial similarity increases, this is an inverse relationship here, increases uh, during summer months. So when there's more humidity in the environment, we are more likely to increase the degree of microbial similarity between us and our fellow occupants, but also between us and the environment. During uh, lower humidity, that changes. Yes, ma'am, sorry. There was a, an interesting finding just a couple of months ago about how in hospitals, if they increase the humidity, there's just lower, um, lower spreading of, of flu and yes. viruses. So how, how do you... So again, this is bacterial similarity, and uh, the outcome of that suggested that the, the bacteria that are actually being increased in exchange in the nasal passage are reducing, yeah, they're being, so there are certain bugs that are really good at allowing viruses to stick onto the outside and allow those viruses to survive longer outside of the body, and there are others where that's not true. And this is work coming out of uh, St. Jude's um, Hospital uh, down in Memphis with, um, his name will come back to me, but really cool guy doing cool stuff. Um, and if you swap out those bugs for ones that the viruses don't like us attaching to, you actually get reduced transmission. And under higher relative humidity conditions, um, we weren't actually able to demonstrate that effectively. We, we looked in the bacterial population, and, but we were only looking at 60s in this case. We didn't do metagenomics in the nose of these people, which was dumb in retrospect, but anyway. Um, we can see uh, genera that are associated with the bugs that they identified as being less likely to allow these viruses to survive outside the host. And so the suggestion is that you get that differentiation in survival response for viruses. But again, hypothesis, you know, hard to test. <laughs> um, oh, yes, button. And um, we uh, produce um, uh, artificial neural networks to derive over time, because we have these very, very dense longitudinal uh, observations, the movement of microbial particles, bacterial and fungal, between different environments. So here I have a staff member, uh, the shirt hem, their nose, their shoe, cell phone, hand, and pager, and gloves that they've used. Um, and here I have a patient, the axilla, that's the armpit, uh, patient hand, patient nose, and the bed rail they're interacting with. These are just some select environments of that 
that situation. And the, the key thing here is that the staff hand is nearly always a, um, a, uh, a source of bacteria uh, to the axilla and patient hand, in this case Acinetobacter, Staphylococcus and Karenibacteria, just to select a few different genera that allow for that movement, right? And th there's an interesting phenomenon. So why is the patient not a source of bacteria to the staff member? In this instance, when you observe people, they tend to do what they should be doing in that environment. And the thing they should be doing is washing their hands between every single patient room because we have a little wash station outside of every single patient room and so what we're seeing here is the staff are going into a patient room and interacting with the patient and depositing their bacteria on the patient I'm crudely over interpreting here and then they come out wash their hands and move on to the next patient right so they are interrupting their colonization route uh, with hand washing because it's an effective way of stripping out that colonization potential but the opposite isn't true because these patients aren't washing their hand after every staff interaction. So we see that, that dynamic interaction which is phased out by behavioural conditions of the occupancy. Um, and we've done this in other places. So this is uh, in uh, a home. It's actually a family of four, their feet, their hands, their noses up the top there. Um, and then things like kitchen floors and bedroom floors and, and counters, again using artificial neural network mapping um, to derive uh, co-associated directional links as microbes move between environments over a period of time. This is actually only six weeks of observation, but daily observation again. Um, and you can see, for example, the feet have very strong microbial interactions with floors irrespective of whether you're wearing socks or you're not wearing socks, right? Because uh, socks aren't a barrier to microbial transmission. Um, and hands and, uh, have bigger interactions with surfaces you interact with your hand. Again, pretty obvious. But um, in this case, this is the hand number one is of an infant who is crawling, and they have a larger degree of microbial sharing with the floor space in the bedroom um, than they do with other environments, and that any other person that's in that environment does, um, showing the uh, ability to actually track and monitor movement. Um, with, uh, with uh, proper statistical tools. When we add dogs into that situation, we actually get an increase in sharing, increase in the movement and the thickness of the lines. Uh, dogs uh, seem to act as a greater conduit of microbial transfer. Uh, in fact, my colleague Rob Knight demonstrated quite effectively um, in a cohort of 140 people, 70 who, uh, cu these were couples, 70 couples had dogs, 70 couples did not have dogs. Those without dogs shared less microbial similarity with their partner than those with dogs, right? It's pointless statistic, but it's fun. In fact, but couples with children had less microbial similarity than couples with dogs. Um, you know, so you know, a child actually prevents you from sharing microbial similarity with your partner, whereas dogs act as a uh, more rapid conduit potentially because they're promiscuous with their love, right? You know, you know, a dog just wants attention no matter who it is. Um, and that's my dog. My wife took this to heart and uh, uh, made me uh, rescue this dog. Uh, this is left over from a, a, a presentation we did for NASA, but I think we should put dogs in space because even astronauts need companions, and maybe the dogs would be helpful. If you ever hear Susan Lynch speak from the University of California, San Francisco, she intimates that dog bacteria are very vital in helping to reduce allergic disease, and therefore putting dogs in space would probably be viable. Although keep them inside the capsule, not, not free-floating, that could be bad. Um, we also know that microbial exchange between people that physically interact um, allows for an increase in microbial similarity. So in this instance, we have uh, a couple here in red and blue um, and a lodger who lives in their space, but who hopefully they don't physically interact with. And, and hands and feet, the couple are always more microbially similar um, than they are to the, um, the, the lodger. The only differentiation in that is noses. Unless you're physically interacting with your nose, which is quite difficult, uh, you, don't, you tend to maintain very, very unique microbial microbial organisms in your nose compared to your partner's nose or other people you physically interact with the nose, which is an interesting phenomenon. Um, in fact, we've seen that reproducibly now over approximately uh, uh, 20,000 observations in different populations, uh, that the nose is very highly differentiated. Ah, um, yes, uh, as far as we can tell, right? Um, and I will guarantee that some of these people were definitely picking their nose because people do live the old time. If you ever, I, I, I have a Tesla and you put it in auto drive and you look out the window to the right and you watch it going by, like every third person is picking their nose in their car and wiping it on something. Um, that's just real normal. So don't feel bad about it. It's fine. Check. There's a, this issue of engraftment is layered on over all of this, right? Mm. So one can imagine that you know, if the, if the rules of the graphic, which are unknown to the, the exonerates, 
um, are such that even if you had contact, yes. you wouldn't see a tag. Right, exactly. Then that's going to, going to skew, obviously. And especially if you have this very unique microflora that's present there. Sorry, microflora is a horrible word. Microbiota that's present there. Thank, Thank you, sorry. <laughs> I'll whip myself later in flagellation. Uh, but yes, um, I just berated someone yesterday for doing that, and I just did it. That's embarrassing, sorry. Because um, the button doesn't work. Um, and we've just, we just finished a study on this, we published last year, um, doing this in um, a dorm room, a new dorm uh, building in the University of Chicago. We followed the entire student body over about four weeks of observation, uh, with daily observation, and you can absolutely identify who goes into whose room um, with a very, very, about 87% accuracy based upon self-reporting. So, you know, people might be lying to us. There were some false positives and some false negatives. But um, uh, on the whole, the interactions between people, such as common room floor and personal shoe, for example, up here, and then uh, hands, um, uh, personal hands, um, and the interaction between hand microbiota is uh, readily identifiable. Which led us to suggest that maybe you could do this with microbial forensics. Now these are um, uh, uh, each individual room, doorknobs, countertops, bedroom floor, kitchen floor, etc. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is the percentage of bacteria or bacterial phytotypes from that surface, unique uh, sequence IDs, uh, that originated uh, from one of uh, six occupants. Person one in red is a 25-year-old man, person two in orange is his dad, person three in yellow is his mum, he lives at home, um, and then he has three dogs. And you can see it immediately at the kitchen counter, for example, the vast majority of bacteria come from the mother uh, because this is a horribly gender imbalanced home. And in fact, when she goes away for a couple of days, the father's microbiota explodes onto the kitchen counter as he desperately fends for himself. Um, <laughs> On the bedroom floor, there's a weird blip from the young man we don't talk about. Um, uh, otherwise, it's mostly dogs. Um, and you have dog bacteria on light switches and doorknobs and uh, bathroom and uh, be, be, uh, sorry, uh, bathroom and front doorknob. Not because the dogs are using the handles, but because you act as a fomite transfer. Everything is being moved all the time. We are literally bathing in a microbial soup, right? And you can't stop that. Uh, so uh, stop trying. Um, I won't learn. And um, we, we did the same exploring this in Air Force cadets. Um, uh, Air Force cadets are unique, right? They come in from all over the country. They're all the same age, approximately. They come into this very homogenizing environment, eating the same food, same exercise regimen, wearing the same clothes, doing the same things day in, day out. And um, we trace them over time, exploring their, uh, their relationships um, uh, microbiologically. And you have a, um, two of them sharing a room. Um, one of them has one desk, the other one has the other desk, and we can see that microbiologically. Uh, we can identify uh, which one skin-wise is using the desk. We can also find gut microbes on different surfaces because obviously that does happen. You know, hands do interact with bottoms and uh, the microbes from that interaction do end up in different areas. And the dorm room floor is kind of a hodgepodge, right? Uh, the space that everybody is using is a hodgepodge of all the microbes from the different place, people. Um, so you can keep that. So what does this mean other, other than just uh, you know, interesting phenomena about humans? Well, we used to play outside. We're exposed to lots of things. Now we live and work inside. We're not exposed to very much. And we try and kill as much as possible, as we heard before. Um, and that eradication of the microbial diversity that we're exposed to is potentially having a, an impact on the training of our immune response in uh, the diversity of antigenic acti activation it can actually receive. So potentially by increasing microbial exposure, you could play a role in moderating or mediating allergic disease phenotypes. Um, working with uh, Carol Ober and uh, Anne Sperling at University of Chicago and Donata Bocelli at Arizona and uh, many other people, we wanted to explore how the environment that you're exposed to may be shaping that immune system response. So for example, if you live in a house and you have plants and increased ventilation from the outside and pets, furry pets especially, uh, or maybe too much moisture and mold growth, or maybe you live in a farm. Right? What impact does that have upon your immune system response? And maybe can that play a role in un helping us to understand why certain people have allergic disease and others don't? Um, and so in this case, we uh, targeted a population called, well, targeted is the wrong word, sorry. We worked with a population uh, called the Amish and another population called the Hutterites. Uh, most people have heard of the Amish, uh, but the Amish and the Hutterites have very similar uh, lifestyle objectives. They've uh, rejected technology. You can take your child to an Amish farm to show them that they can survive without an iPad for more than 10 minutes without screaming. It's possible. Um, otherwise, uh, they, uh, they live um, a very uh, agrarian lifestyle. The big difference between the Amish and Hutterites, despite the fact they have the 
same genetic precursors for the development of asthmatic disease. Um, the Amish live on their farms um, uh, from the front doors 50 feet from the barn door, right? The kids are literally growing up, working and, and playing on this farm environment. The Hutterites don't. The, the, farm, the ha ha homing commune is separate from the farming commune and uh, only the men are allowed to transit backwards and forwards in buggies on a daily basis. The Amish have about 4% asthma in the population. The US average is 8%, so about half the US average. Um, um, and that goes for across for a lot of allergic diseases, although our data sets are bad because of epidemiological problems in, in getting data out of the populations. The Hutterites have three times the US average in disease risk, almost 25%. Um, so a massive elevation in um, asthmatic onset in this population by the age of eight. Um, and uh, we can see that in their immune systems, there's a big differentiation. So blue is Amish, red is Hutterites. These are neutrophils. So the Amish have more neutrophils circulating in their system than the Hutterites, potentially because they're experiencing more antigenic exposure. Um, the Hutterites have more eosinophils, uh, especially pro-inflammatory IL-22 mediating eosinophils in the lung space, uh, potentially again because uh, they, they have uh, heightened levels of inflammatory disease. Um, uh, but the Hutterites also have elevated levels of CXCR4 and CD11 B and C on the neutrophils, suggesting that the neutrophils are older, they've been in circulation for longer, um, and uh, they're not being used as much. Um, and um, Anne Sperling has a very particular hypothesis about this. Uh, uh, CXCR4 especially, but CD11B, um, these uh, two self-surface markers can actually increase uh, the stickiness as hypothesis, but the stickiness of neutrophils. So if the neutrophils start to stick together in circulation, they can form rafts, and the eventual observation by this neutrophil raft of an antigen will cause a much bigger immune response, right? potentially promoting um, an inflammatory reaction. Um, and uh, in this construct, um, uh, working with Donato Bocelli and our germ free facility um, at University of Chicago, uh, we explore what would happen if mice breathed in um, the same antigenic environment as the children. So we snuck into the kids' bedrooms late at night, taking dust from the Amish kids' bedrooms and the Hutterites' kids' bedrooms, like kind of a reverse Grinch. Um, and that dust was then uh, created into an interest nasal installation medium, and we placed it inside the nasal tract to allow it to interact with the epithelium. Um, and then we uh, exposed them to an antigen which they had previously been um, uh, exacerbated towards, um, avalbumin. And in this case, uh, avalbumin will cause a significant eosinophilic response. If we give them dust intranasally expressed from the Amish children, it protects against that eosinophilic response to avalbumin. If we give them uh, dust from Hutterite children's bedrooms, it has no protection effect. Um, okay, great. So the dust appears to be magic, and that, that suggests that you should go and uh, you know rub your face in the cow of an Amish farm or something like that or you know like go down to the Amish people and say can I buy some dust and blow it into your children's faces um, we have no idea what the dose dependent relationship to dust exposure is do you need to rub your one year old's face into the side of a cow once or do you have to do it once a week what's the relationship um, but we found another interesting phenomenon when we started to look at the gut so we took the uh, Amish and Hutterite fecal stool and we tr transplanted them via a humanization study into germ free mice um, and we then uh, uh, exposed them to avalbumin uh, responses and we, we saw a differential response in bowel eosinophils post exacerbation um, and in this case associating with the Amish poop promotes eosinophilic response uh, to avalbumin but um, protects in a way that the eosinophils can differentiate it into what we're referring to as homeostatic eosinophils versus pro-inflammatory eosinophils and this relationship when the buttons work is directly associated with um, serum-based concentrations of different metabolic components. So 3-phenylpropanoic acid and indole-3-acetic acid are significantly elevated in mice that have been colonized with Amish poop. Um, and uh, indole-3-acetic acid in our in vitro assays, working with a, a very talented uh, assistant professor, uh, Hugh Chu, at the uh, University of California, San Diego, has demonstrated a significant response to an AHR1-mediated interaction on the eosinophil. Were you just scratching your head, or I didn't know if you had a question? And um, this uh, mediated response seems to drive um, an IL-22 mediated response uh, but, and a, a reduction in dendritic cell activation and type 2 cytokine re reduction, which is uh, responsive to asthma as a phenotype. So it, it appears, all right, hand wavy, no proof, but this is where the evidence points, right? 
If you're exposed to things early in life, it may shape an immune system activation which changes what can live in your gut, maybe what colonizes or colonization efficiency, and that can change what metabolic products those bacteria are producing, which has distal effects via what we could refer to as the gut-lung axis. I don't know, can we have gut-lung axis, Selene? Is that allowed? We've got gut-brain, you know? Um, and that can mediate um, immune responses in uh, distal lung uh, cell populations, immune populations in that space. Yeah. So are, the, are the heterites more extreme than conventional lifestyle? Like, do they have a higher? I mean, because that doesn't really make sense. But they're, they're, they would yeah. Have if you look at the US population as an average, they have very different genetic predispositions, right? So some people have virtually no genetic predisposition to the development of asthma, some people have very exacerbated ones, whereas Hutterites and Amish both have very elevated levels of asthma predisposition based on genetic profiling, right? They all have the same loci um, that uh, are associated with asthma predisposition. So, um, we, you know, it's an unfair representation to compare them to the rest of the U.S. population. You'd have to compare them to U.S. population who had exacerbated it, it, inflammatory potential, right? But um, yeah, that's a differentiation. What we haven't yet looked at, because these seem protective, what we haven't looked at are the things which could be exacerbatory for the Hutterites. And so the alternate hypothesis is that these things are causing um, uh, are buggering things up, but things like carnitine, I mean, what am I supposed to do with that, you know? Uh, is carnitine now an asthma progenitor? There's so many metabolites as well. And also, um, as I'm sure most of the people, my colleagues in the room will understand, so many of the things which you can't actually identify. Um, there's so many unknown peaks, it gets really messy. Um, uh, working uh, with a very talented postdoc, Anukriti Sharma, um, who's just going into labor now, This is cool. So you're gonna have a baby, a lab baby. I love lab babies. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, I've been checking on my phone. Anyway, um, uh, she uh, divided asthmatic subjects in healthy controls and tried to identify whether we could use machine learning to take the fungal populations from the upper respiratory airway and differentiate between um, low and high um, uh, type 2 mediated allergic status or atopy status. And indeed, with a very high degree of efficacy, you can, which provides us with this rapid screening procedure, right? Um, an asthmatic comes in, we could screen them, put them in a probability band for type 1, or uh, sorry, type 2 low, high, or um, atopy uh, differentiation, and then uh, tailor their um, uh, treatment strategy based on that. And in fact, uh, this is work with Steve White at University of Chicago, um, who is exploring that um, in a new trial now, um, identifying, you know, so stratifying the population and then delivering um, uh, precision uh, treatments, in this case, an antibiotic treatment uh, to patients that are on the basis. Oh, yeah, that's it. Sorry, I ran out of slides. Uh, thank you. There's a book. <laughs> Go ahead,